Hi, my name is John Saki, and today I'm here to teach you how to not go broke trying to manage your wealth. I'm a financial advisor with Bank of Montreal Private Wealth. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Don't Go Broke Trying. I am your host, Rennie. Thank you so much for listening to another episode. I really do appreciate you. If you're new here, maybe this is your first time listening. Don't Go Broke Trying is a podcast where we teach people how to not go broke trying to live their best life. And today we have a very special episode. Today we're going to be talking about how to not go broke trying to manage your wealth. I know a lot of us during the pandemic especially became DIY advisors and we're all managing our portfolios by ourselves. But there is a lot of value in seeking professional advice, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. A lot of you have been asking me to bring a professional financial advisor or investment advisor on the podcast, so that is exactly who I have here for you today. So today I have John Saki here. Hi, John. Hi, Renny. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Fine, thank you, and thank you so much for having me yes, today. Yes, thank you for coming on. So everyone, John and I actually worked together when I was working at BMO Private Wealth, and as many of you know, I worked at in a, in a wealth management firm before I leaped into content creation. And John was one of the advisors that I supported. So I was helping him create marketing plans to help his business grow. And I'm very excited to hear more from him and teach us a little bit about uh, teach us not how to go broke uh, managing our own wealth. So, John, are you ready for this episode? <laughs> I sure am. And yeah. again, thank you so much for having me here. Big privilege. Yes, yes. Thank you for coming. So I just wanted to know a little bit about you and really just tell us about your business, actually. Like, tell us a little bit about you, please. Sure. Thank you so much. I was raised in Johannesburg, South Africa. Mm-hmm. Came here in 1988. It was July the 1st, really to seek my fortune. And I found it in finance. I've spent my entire career in finance and investor relations. And certainly this summer marks 10 years at BMO Private Wealth. Oh, wow. And it's a real pleasure and a real honor to manage money for 280 somewhat families across the city from all walks of life. Oh, very cool. Very enriching, emotionally rewarding and busy business that I find myself running now. Very, very busy business. As being someone who supported your <laughs> the different businesses, I see that it's an extremely hard job, extremely busy job. So kudos to you for, for, for doing that. Uh, before we get into this, we always like to give a disclaimer that none of this is financial advice. This is just what we would do in certain situations, but none of this is financial advice. So make sure you consult a professional for your own situation. Okay, we usually start with a Renny rated segment, and that is basically something that you're really loving right now. So when I love a product, I say that it's Renny rated. So what's something that you're really loving right now? It can be a product, a service, a song, anything, a food. Wow, that's a very interesting (laughs) question. So I'm trying to watch my weight. (laughs) I do love pizza, but I'm trying to stay away from that. I do enjoy a good pizza with basil and mozzarella cheese, Mm -hmm. tomato sauce with a touch of garlic. But really, my passions are music. If I wasn't a financial advisor, I'd um, be a full-time music guy. Oh, really? Producing music, singing, what would you be doing? Not so much, actually, listening to music. (laughs) (laughs) I should tell you that uh, in the early days of COVID, my wife took up the drums. And three years later, we're trying to find her entrance into a band. Mm, Cool. (laughs) But as far as I'm concerned, I listen to lots of music. It can be anything from... Beyonce to Shakira, I listened to today on in the car on the way here. Nice. Love you too. Love Pink Floyd and try to go to several concerts a year. So certainly now that we're coming out of COVID, I hope to have a busy summer at, at some concerts. Nice. I love that. I don't go to many concerts, but hopefully this summer I'll go to one or two. Okay. Thank you for sharing that with us. So we really want to get to know the real you. So can you bring us all the way back to the beginning and tell us a little bit about how you were raised and what was your first memory of money? My first memory of money, I was about 11 years old Mm -hmm. and my late grandmother used to take my brother and I to my uncle or her son's best friend who used to be a stockbroker on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Mm. This was in the mid-70s when then 13 and 14-year-old guys could run across the trading floor 
handing trading tickets to brokers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Apparently, compliance has changed since then. Yeah. <laughs> and that's when I certainly got my first taste of, of money and how the stock markets might behave. Mm -hmm. We were raised very humbly, and we were raised that in order to have a good life, one has to work very hard. In other words, a high work ethic. Mm -hmm. And so my second recollection really was money about money was coming to Canada in 1988 and not having any money. Mm -hmm. And as a first-generation first immigrant, there weren't back then as many, let's call them social services, as there are today. Mm -hmm. And so it really was a case of hustle, hustle, hustle. And since then, haven't really looked back. The road is never clear-cut. There's always decisions to be made. Mm -hmm. But raised with a high work ethic and being a first-generation immigrant taught me a lot about how money works, how to accumulate it, and how to live such a life where you have a good life, but you respect money as well. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, humble beginnings always end up, well, typically end up well. So after that, you became an investment advisor. How did you transition? How did you know you wanted to become an investment advisor? Like, how did that transition happen? So it's a great question. I entered the investment advisory business really somewhat late in my career. Okay. I was 40 five at the time oh so we, BMO was your first place that you, you started at BMO yes oh okay very yes. cool yes so what happened is that I came to Canada in 1988 my first job was at uh, Sam the record man okay <laughs> and then at pizza pizza in the phone room as a, a customer service manager mm -hmm. and then I applied for an ad as a marketing guy as we used to be called um, in the telecom space Grew from there, and then I morphed into my own company called Saki and Associates. We were set up to do public and investor relations and had a very, very good run at that, about a 15-year run. Mm. That would take me up to about 2010. Traveled the world, did really cool things for interesting clients, most in, mostly in the area of public and media and investor relations. And what with the internet dominating then, the value of public and media and investor relations going down, I also developed somewhat a fear of flying. I was having to travel all the time, missing out on family gatherings. I'm a family man. Mm -hmm. Back then, I had two young teenage kids, and I made the decision that this wasn't going to be a type of lifestyle, living out of suitcases that I wanted. Mm -hmm. My brother, Dan, has been at BMO for, he joined probably in the late 90s, mm -hmm. And he got me an interview. Oh, wow. And to this day, I'm eternally grateful to my brother Dan for not only getting me in the door, but really paving the way, nurturing me, teaching me, um, doing all sorts of things, teaching me the business. It's a very, very nuanced business. So I pay tremendous homage to Dan to this day, who has played a very, very instrumental role in my success and those of our clients. Yeah. So what, for those who may not know, because a lot of our, our listeners may not know, what is an investment advisor? Like, what do, what do you actually do? Well, some people would say we play Monopoly with other people's money. Okay. <laughs> but that, again, is pure myth. So as an investment advisor, there's a lot more to the picture than as people would think, oh, you just buy and sell stocks. Mm -hmm. So certainly, if I look back at the past three and a half years through covid I was as much an investment advisor as I was a family counselor, a therapist, a listening ear, a rock of Gibraltar, <laughs> the really one constant in the lives of my clients. Mm -hmm. But what really does an investment advisor do? Well, first and foremost, we manage money. We manage investments. Okay. First and foremost. You do that by trading, but that's just the start of it. There's a lot more financial planning that goes into the picture now. There's a lot more hand-holding, education, tax reporting, calculations, dealing with one's clients, other trusted advisors, whether it be the family lawyer, mm -hmm. the family accountant, the beneficiaries, the executor. And so it's become, in my 10 and a bit years in the business, it's become a lot more complex, a lot more nuanced, and a lot more complicated mm -hmm. 
than it was when I started. And even having spoken to veterans like my brother, back then it was just pick a mutual fund. Yeah, <laughs> and now it's... And now it's anything but that. Okay, that's good to know because I'm sure a lot of people do think it's still just pick a mutual fund. So it's it's like an entire wealth planning practice, essentially. Correct. And as one's clients become wealthier and more sophisticated, so too, the de- so too do the demands change. Mm-hmm. So it's not just, oh, I've got 50,000, press some buttons and we'll see how it goes. Yeah. It's now I've got $3 million, a complex financial tapestry. What now? Mm-hmm. And we've got to provide the what nows. Yeah. Okay. So, are there any differences between an investment advisor, a wealth manager, a financial planner, a financial advisor? I feel like we hear a lot of these terms. So, are there any differences between them? Yes and no. Okay. Let me clarify. Let me classify, and let me explain if I might. As one might guess, our industry is highly regulated and highly compliant. Mm-hmm. We report into numerous federal and provincial bodies, most notably IROC, which is, which is the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada. Mm-hmm. Let's go through the different titles, if you will. And there are designations for each. A financial planner, in the typical sense of the word, sits in a retail branch. They're licensed to really sell two things. That bank's mutual funds and that bank's GICs. And generally speaking, there's a threshold of a few hundred thousand dollars that they can deal with of assets under management before they should hand that off to the next level. And in most cases, financial planners are licensed under MFDA which is the Mutual Fund Dealer Association, which, as I understand, is in the process now of of merging merging, with IROC. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know, by the way, um, GICs are Guaranteed Investment Certificates, and mutual funds are basically like a group of stocks. Is that a good way to describe it? A simplified way. A simplified (laughs) way. A mutual fund is what I will call respectable respectively, a black box of stocks and bonds. Okay, okay. And there are many, many different mutual funds, multiple tens of thousands that one can choose from. Okay, so that's a financial planner, and they would sit at this BMO location, for example. So when you go into your branch, that person that you would meet up with would be a financial planner. And maybe they can manage 200,000 or less. Does it depend on the branch? Depends on the bank or depends upon where they set their limits, which can be hard set or soft set, a couple hundred thousand generally. Okay. Okay. Then you'll get a financial advisor. Financial advisor is licensed under IROC to trade stocks, bonds, preferred shares in a very, very large sort of world is your oyster type of scenario. They can buy any product from any financial institution. And think of it as they're a notch or two higher in licensing than a financial planner. A financial planner can do plans, financial plans, as well as an investment advisor. Okay. Can do plans using software and then present them. Mm-hmm. A wealth advisor has completed the course is required to become what is called a CIM, Mm. a Certified Investment Manager, again, through IROC. I am a wealth advisor, Mm -hmm. having completed the certifications seven, eight years ago, Mm -hmm. which entitles me to work for a higher net worth client, do financial plans, and trade any product from any company. And then there is another designation that's called a portfolio manager. And that I regard as the highest sense of fiduciary responsibility in the land. I've earned that qualification by distinction several years ago based upon completion of certain examinations, study through the Canadian Securities Institute, 
under IROC regulation, and your financial institution has to back that up as well. Oh, okay. And that gives you the, the, right, the right to trade clients' accounts on a discretionary basis. What does that mean? Without having to discuss trades with them prior. Okay. So within a certain mandate, a growth mandate or a balanced mandate, as a portfolio manager, I have carte blanche, as long as I stick to the framework mm -hmm. of their mandate, to select securities of my own choosing based upon research that I do or external research to which I subscribe. Okay. So if you're not a portfolio manager, you cannot trade on a uh, discretionary basis? That's that is understand. correct. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Good to know. That is correct. And I should add that the penalty for trading on a discretionary basis when you're not licensed is very, very severe. Mm, okay, good to know. For obvious reasons, because no financial institution is looking for problems. And clients can get very upset. Of course, it's their if, money, right? <laughs> it's their money and clients can get very upset if oh, a trade happened and they weren't told about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I honestly did not know any, like I've worked with all these people, but I didn't really know the key differences between each. So what about the financial threshold? So I know the fi financial planner, you said zero to one hundred, there's a few hundred thousand. What about the next level? Who, how, what type of thresholds would they be working with? So really, it's a great question, Renny. Above and beyond the financial planner, the broad title is really financial advisor. Okay. And... Different financial advisors have different minimums. I know financial advisors that won't take on a household, if you will, with less than $5 million of investable assets. Oh, wow. <laughs> some are 3 million, some are 1 million, and some are less. That in many cases will depend upon the financial institution's limits, mm -hmm. if you will. Because the banks have come to the conclusion, rightfully so, that nothing destroys client-like of a bank than being in the wrong part of it. Mm. That's what's called a detractor. Clients don't want that. So banks are quite picky for good reason as to what their limits might be. Okay. My limit as a financial advisor, it's really a quarter of a million dollars okay. in the household, okay. which is... If the spouses, if his spouses, his and or hers RSP, TFSA, mm -hmm. RESP, I'm generally looking for about a quarter of a million dollars. Okay, so when we say quarter million, so minimum is two hundred fifty thousand dollars of investable assets or more. You're looking for, so you're looking for the value of all of their current invest or savings slash investments. Correct. So they're RESP, as you said, their TFSA, their RRSP, what else would they have? Their R -E -S -P. Mm -hmm. they might have some money in a lira, which is called a locked-in retirement account mm -hmm. from a previous employer. Okay. And they might have a good old-fashioned investment account. Yeah, so a non-registered account. Non-registered, as we call it. Okay, cool. So, I don't know, okay, so... Their house does not is not a, a an anything that you take into account. Like if they have a million dollar house, which most people now do because that's like the average price here, it doesn't mean that you can now go and see a financial advisor, uh, or right because that's not an investable asset. If I understand correctly, correct. Okay, it's what we call um, net liquid assets. Mm -hmm. Again, a house isn't a liquid asset. Cars are not an asset. At all, a liability. Yeah. <laughs> I hope everyone heard that. <laughs> Cars are not an asset. They are a liability. Yes, they take money out of your pocket. And we don't regard things like stamp collections, <laughs> coin collections, okay. etc. cetera. So you like the cash, the, the cold hard cash or That's right. investments. That's right. Okay, that makes sense. So I know that a lot of my followers are probably not at that maybe $250,000 range yet that they can afford to hire a wealth manager. But So a lot of them are doing DIY investing. I am one of them. I currently manage my portfolio, and I think I think my portfolio is over, two, maybe two, around the two hundred thousand dollar mark at this nice. point. So it's it's been going pretty well, um, and I've been doing it since I was eighteen, so seven years at this point. Um, and I liquidated a few years ago to purchase a home, but um, it's all the rage right now. So 
it works for some people. It doesn't work for others. So could you tell us any like common financial mistakes you would see when people try to manage their own money? Yeah. I just want to go back onto a previous question and then I'll answer this one. With respect to my limits as a financial advisor, it really is a soft 250000 Okay. Because it goes back to what do I look for in a client or what is an ideal client? Mm -hmm. An ideal client shows potential. They show that they're serious about wealth accumulation and there's potential to truly help them because deep down in my psyche, helping somebody is far more important than the fee that it will or will not generate. Mm -hmm. So to put it bluntly, I'd rather work with a newly graduated couple with 90,000 in assets, both of whom are professional, than somebody significantly older who doesn't quite see things in the same light as one would think that I would, mm -hmm. and they've got three million. Okay. And that type of person may or may not be able to be helped. Yeah. I would stack, I would stand back from that type of an engagement. Okay. So I'm looking for potential. Mm -hmm more than anything. To get to your question about DIY investing being the rage. Yeah. <laughs> Any mistakes that you see for, that people are making? Because, again, it works well for some people, but it does not work for a lot of people. A lot of people lose a lot of money while they are doing this. So any mistakes you see often? I see a lot of mistakes. So yeah. first of all, if I just look back, Really, the rise of the ETF, the Exchange Traded Fund, or the index, made very popular DIY investing. Yeah. And discount brokerages made it even more popular, where for $9.99 a trade, $6.99, and some brokerages, <laughs> they don't charge. Yeah. For example, like a Wealth Simple or one of these, yeah, it's, it's all free. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And free is hard to beat. Yeah. I get it. Mm -hmm. Everybody's fee sensitive. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of errors that I see. Okay. And it's all very well paying no management fees, but what's the use of it? That's going to cost you 20% yeah. a year. <laughs> yeah. You're better off hiring an advisor. So what do I see? A few things. Number one, we're all human and we suffer from the human condition. Mm. And there is very, very small possibility that a good do-it-yourselfer can separate their emotions from rationality. In other words, they're selling when they should buy and they're buying when they should sell. Yes. And I see it all the time. How do I see it? Business that I win, I need to see their statements yeah. so we can transfer whatever it is that they're holding to BMO and I see mistake after mistake after mistake. Mm -hmm. So it's separating motion from reality. Yeah. The second condition that I see all the time is a psychological condition called anchoring. Okay. And what that means is they're waiting to get their money back. They bought a stock at $10 and then it went to $9 and $8 and $7 and they can't bear to sell at a loss. Yeah. And they're waiting for it to come back to $10. When it probably will not. When it probably will not. Mm -hmm. And if it does, it might come back there in two, three, four, five, or ten years. Yeah. And that is a terrible trait that we all suffer from. Yeah, it's like the sunk cost fallacy. It's like, oh, I already put this such time and money That's into right. it. I, I'm not going to take it out because it's, it's already there, right? And then you keep waiting, and it's just getting worse and worse and worse. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Another human condition that we suffer from, and it's one of the tenets in our business, it's the past is no predictor of the future. And just because stock A did A, B, and C two years ago does not, does not mean that that will repeat. Mm -hmm. Just because the roulette ball fell on red seven times in a row, the probability of it falling on red on the eighth spin is still 50-50. Yeah. Well, you've got two green numbers, zero and double zero, but it doesn't increase the chances just of it coming onto black the next spin. I like that analogy. So one has to be very, very careful um, of that characteristic. Something else I see all the time is dollar cost averaging down. Mm. Particularly, I've seen that with Nortel, positions that I win. 
Nortel, as we know, is worthless for several years now. Yeah. <laughs> People were buying it at 90 and at 80 and at 70 and at 60. And on life support, they were still buying it <laughs> so, because it had to go up. So for someone who may not know what Nortel is, can you explain that quickly? Yeah. So, Northern, so Nortel was prior to that Northern Telecom before it abbreviated its name. It was Canada's darling company. At one point, it had the largest capitalization of any company in Canada. Mm. That's the worth of the company. And through a series of, dare I say, mismanagement, trials and tribulations, essentially the company filed for bankruptcy. And with it took tens, if not hundreds of thousands of investors worldwide. Yeah. It was a very, very widely held stock in Canada. And at one time, Canada's most widely held stock. Wow. And today that company no longer exists. It was, it was sold off in parts. And I see it that people were dollar cost averaging down because it had to go up. No stock has to go up yeah. and no stock has to go down. Mm -hmm. Another basic blunder that I see all the time is what we refer to as concentration risk, where a large portion of one's portfolio consists of a single stock. Yeah. Oh, I love Facebook. Mm -hmm. I love Apple. Mm -hmm. I love BMO. So I'm going to buy all of their stocks. Yeah, And that's it. <laughs> that's the majority of my portfolio, right? And that is very, very risky because any and every stock, no matter how strong the company is, is going to have its time in the sun, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And not everything's going to go up in a straight line or down for that matter. Yeah, I think a lot of people need to realize that although the stock market has always gone up in general, like over the long term, it's gone up. It doesn't mean that individual companies don't fail. So you can invest in an individual company and it, it could go all the way to zero. <laughs> and so I, would, I always tell people, be careful. Investing in individual stocks when you don't have the knowledge or you're probably not even doing enough research about the company is a pretty risky strategy. Very, very risky. So I don't encourage that type of an approach. Mm -hmm. Another error that I see is I'll call it over diversification mm. or in slang words diversification <laughs> okay. whereby there are ETFs or indexes that are very broad that will hold 9,000 equity names mm. in other words you're playing the universe yeah. <laughs> you have every company possible inside of there <laughs> correct mm -hmm. and another do-it-yourself error I find is that people will look at their portfolio sporadically when times are bad, the do-it-yourself investor won't even open a statement many times. <laughs> and then they'll trade and it'll all be good. And then they'll change jobs. It'll be the summer. Their kid will be getting married. They might have health issues where they are prevented from looking at their portfolio for a few months. For life circumstances, life happens. So contrary to popular belief, money management is day in and day out and it's consistent, Rennie. It's not, I'll do it when I have time or between periods of the hockey game. <laughs> it's all the time. Okay, yeah, good to know. So I guess I, my next question for you would be, do you think it's important for people to, speak, uh, to seek professional financial advice? I think I know your answer, but maybe <laughs> you can ask, ask, answer that for me. Yeah, so I speak from personal experience here. Every time I've tried to do something, that I know I'm not good at, to save a fee, mm -hmm. <laughs> it just doesn't work out well. Mm -hmm. Whether that's a dental issue that I'm having, whether that's catering a banquet, whether that's something far simpler as changing the oil in my car. I guess I could buy a book, Car Mechanics for Dummies. <laughs> I guess I could figure it out, but I don't. Yeah. My time is too valuable and I don't have the expertise. And I think the same can be said for investment advisory. If you have the expertise, and let me just clarify what that might look like. If you have analytical tools, if you have the time, if you have the academic underpinnings and are able to separate emotion from reality, you really don't need an investment advisor. No different than if I have the dental equipment, have been to, the den have been to dental school, I, I guess I don't need a dentist. Mm -hmm. I've got the knowledge. 
maybe that's not a good example. I, I don't think dentists can um, fill their own teeth. <laughs> yeah. But the perfect example is taxes. You don't need an accountant if you've got the academic underpinnings, the experience, the time, and the software. Yeah. The same is with our business. Okay. And unfortunately, 99% of people who are managing their own investments really have little to no idea about what they're doing. Yeah. And I see it all the time. Fair enough. Uh, I, yeah, so I think the key things, as you mentioned, is you need to have the, first of all, the desire to manage your own portfolio. Because I feel like a lot of people are tr they're trying to do it, but you don't actually want to do it. And that's going to reflect in how you're actually approaching it. You also have to have the time, and it's a very time-consuming thing. Although there are lazy couch potato ways to invest, I think you actually do need to dedicate time, especially up front, to understanding the fundamentals and things like that. You also need to have the expertise, and this is the hardest part. Um, and a lot of us just don't have the capacity to truly understand what it means to <laughs> manage your own portfolio. So I think those, if you have those three things and you can check yes to all these boxes, maybe then you don't need to seek any uh, financial advice. But I guess I would ask you, the average person does not have $250,000, for example, to use, or to use the services of a financial advisor. So... Is professional financial advice for everyone or is it just for the ultra-rich? How, how does that work? Or what would you tell my audience? Very good question. So different firms have different limits again. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, I don't know any offhand, but I'm sure there are firms on the street whereby thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, you can work with some type of advisory. It might be a very light advisory. It might be some generic advisory. It might be their own proprietary mutual funds, but I'd argue even that is better than managing your own money. Mm. And there, there are some myths that I just wanted to comment on that I hear all the time. Wealth management is only for the wealthy. Yeah, that's what I hear often. I hear that all the time, and to that I say, well, how do you think they became wealthy? But how... How do they, even the $30,000 that you're talking about, I know a lot of people who just don't have that to go to even the minimum, the people who accept, maybe they accept $30,000 as clients. So how, like, if they don't even have $30,000 to manage, then, like, or to get professional financial advice, then how, how do they even get to that point? Do they have to start self-managing and then maybe get to that point? Like, how does that I, work? I would think so. So certainly what I've done for a lot of my clients they might have, my average client is 57 years old, so they've got offspring that are early 20s, just beginning their career or mid-20s. Mm -hmm. I've onboarded all of the children of my clients, grandfathered them mm -hmm. under my clients' agreements, and I get tremendous pleasure from working with the next generation who might have only 25,000, mm -hmm. and they're getting the same type of service with their accounts as their parents are, because one day they too will have well-paying jobs mm -hmm. in potentially lucrative careers. And I find that very gratifying. So it's the case of in this business, as in most businesses, if you don't ask, you don't get. Okay. And I'm sure, although I don't know of any as I sit here right now, I'm sure that there are advisors at certain firms that would onboard a $30,000 client that's showing potential interest and a desire to grow with them mm -hmm. because those clients that are young can be lucrative for many years yeah. to the financial institution or to the advisor that is concerned mm -hmm. so there are options and then with even with robo advisors there are options there too that's true very true one option i really don't like though is mm -hmm. the do-it-yourselfer Okay, so robo-advisors. Can you tell us what a robo-advisor is before? Yeah, great question. And that came about a few years ago whereby it's the AI or the robot, mm -hmm. as it were, that for the most part manages your investments. It's simplified, it's light, and for the most part it's not customized. Online tools, the AI assesses your risk based upon certain questions it asks mm -hmm. and the way you respond your age, goals. your debt, your goals, 
your marital status, et cetera, et cetera, not to also to forget what sort of income you are making. And it will put you into one of their portfolios that match your tolerance for risk. Mm -hmm. I'd argue even that's better okay. than the do-it-yourself. And the other area where I also bring your attention to, financial planner at any of the certainly big five financial institutions, yeah. their minimums at the branch level are very, very, very low. Okay. A few hundred dollars, a okay. couple thousand dollars, they'll start to work with you. Okay, so that's good to know. So if maybe you're not at the $30,000 level or obviously $100,000, 250000 maybe you can start off with a robo-advisor where I think they don't, like I know Wealth Simple's minimum is like $500 to start with their robo-advisor. So it's you're saying that it's better than professional, it's better than um, than doing it, trying to do it yourself, especially if you don't have the time and, and everything. Uh, and at least you're still getting some kind of professional advice through that medium that's right and you're getting some sort of a diversified portfolio mm -hmm. based upon how you respond to your questions you're getting some risk management built in yeah. and then another thing that i encourage all people do, to do especially the younger people is get into the discipline of monthly saving yeah it's the oldest trick in the book wealth accumulation pay yourself first i agree I always tell people, I think I have a whole episode on that. <laughs> Pay yourself first. Like every single time you get paid, make it a habit of set, putting something aside. And maybe it's 10% of your paycheck every time or 20% away into an account uh, for investing, one for saving, one for maybe your travel fund, you know, different goals that you have in life. Yeah. Absolutely. I cannot underestimate the importance of that. And that goes back to one of the things I said at the beginning of the discussion today is another lesson I learned very early. Regular savings. Mm -hmm can't be beaten it, it really can't it's it's game changing especially when you automate it so that it has nothing to do with you it's just like every first day of the month the money comes out of your account immediately you don't even have the chance to spend it i think uh, yeah that's a great tip and automating it as you touched upon is so important banks have tools now where it's automated mm -hmm. and it's just another dare i say bill in quotation marks it's not a bill mm -hmm that you pay every month, yeah. except this isn't a bill that's going to your hydro or your gas or your, or your pool maintenance. It's going to your future. And as, as I tell my children, um, and as I tell everybody, the right time to start planning for your future is immediately. Yes, today, yeah. Okay, so now we know that we should seek some kind of financial advice and you actually can get it at any level. Now that I know that, I didn't know that. Um, so if a client did want to work with you, how do you, how do you help your clients define their financial goals and create a plan? Like what, basically, what does the process look like when a client would come to you and work with you? Great question. Each advisor works a little bit differently. I can speak to how I work. So I take a deep interest in not only the livelihoods, but also the lives of our clients. So it's a face-to-face, -face, ideally, meeting at my clients' houses. I love to go to clients' houses across the GTA. It might be in my office, which is in North York at Young and Shepherd, or it might be in a place of their choosing. Chat with them, understand what their goals are, make notes, and get fairly specific with respect to their goals, other than, yeah, at some point I want to retire, yeah. <laughs> or I want to have millions of dollars. That's a relative question. Is millions of dollars two or 12? Yeah. <laughs> how long is a piece of string so to speak mm -hmm. and start doing calculations early on in the discussions to know the client's financial fabric it's a, as I said earlier on it's a very nuanced business and just because you're 30 years old and making 100,000 doesn't mean to say that person A and person B financial fabric although those circumstances are identical are the same, they could be very different. Mm -hmm. So, deep understanding. Secondly, engage our financial planning group mm. to do a financial plan. So you have a separate team that focuses on financial planning? Yeah, okay. part of my group, but all that they do is financial planning. Nice. And why is that so important? Because this is not a business of just about how much money you make, Oh, I made 8%, I lost 3%, I made 12%. It 
That's all well and good. And I'd argue that that's today little more than table stakes. Okay. And it goes back to when people ask me what I do, I could say I'm a financial advisor, I'm a portfolio manager, I'm a money guy. Whilst all of those are true, when you take a big step back and when people ask me what do I do, the answer is I deliver financial peace of mind. And without a financial plan, there's little financial peace of mind. And if you take that a step further, I ask people, have you got a financial plan? Well, yes, I hear all the time. Let's see it. Well, you know, I put it on the back of a napkin and we went out for chicken wings and then the <laughs> beer spilled on the plan on the back of the napkin. And there goes the plan. Mm -hmm. That's not the way I look at things. So we take a deep dive into the financial planning process. It's granular and I can't underestimate the importance of a financial plan in terms of being one of the tenets of our offering. Mm -hmm. Nice. I actually think that if nothing else that people get from a relationship with a financial planner or a financial advisor, I think just the plan would help a lot of people just even understand what's going on. Because I always tell people the first thing you need to do, first of all, create a budget, right? Understand what comes into your account each month, what goes out of your account each month. And then when you sit with the planner, you really see that, okay, if I actually want to retire by 65, I have a lot of things that I need to do. Maybe I need to up my savings, up my investing now so that by the time I'm 65 it actually will work out so I think a lot of people just don't they have no they have no understanding of what's even going on in their account so they they have no plan at all so I think that would that's a really valuable part of working with you so and then once they actually once you've onboarded them what happens after that we really understand the whole financial fabric a lot of times people come aboard, they've got money here, money there, they don't have a will, they haven't reviewed their financial plan or they don't have a financial plan. Life insurance, they don't know, they've got some nominal insurance through their employer, mm -hmm. they've got an old pension plan over here, they don't know who their executor is, they know really nothing, nothing about anything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these people can have considerable wealth, yeah. a few million dollars, and they're busy raising kids and working and hustling, taking care of parents, might be so there's lots of what i'll call moving parts and our job in the first year is to bring all those moving parts so to speak home mm -hmm. tie up all the loose ends that have been lingering because one of the big things that we notice is procrastination people don't want to deal with money to get people to attend to their wills and powers of attorney both critical documents Sometimes it's easier to pull teeth without anesthetic than that. <laughs> and so it really is bringing the household to a place of, of cool ease and peace of mind. And that can take up to a year yeah. because we recognize that our clients are busy as well. They've got lives, they travel, kids, family. So it's really at their pace with what I'll say gentle, loving care and an occasional little nudge. Okay, cool. And so it seems like it's a holistic wealth planning process when it when somebody works with you. So I know you mentioned estates and wills. So it's not just, I think, the again, the real value of this is you get the plan, they, can, they have an ongoing relationship with you, you're managing their investments, but they also have access to a wealth planning team that can help them with their finalized what's going to go on with their estate after they pass, right? And all, all of these different things. I think when I was working at BMO, there was a trust and estates team, but then there's also the financial planning team. Who else is... And then you can link them with accountants and lawyers if they want. Like it's, a, it's, it's the whole advisory team supporting them. Yeah, so certainly BMO Private Wealth is that. Mm -hmm. It's a large team, yeah. and we're accustomed to working with people with wealth, and when you have wealth, that being a relative term, there can be complexities and complications and nuances mm -hmm. that can very simply be overlooked. You know, as I say to my 25-year-old son, when you're, when you're very young, as long as you've got enough money in the bank for beer on a Saturday night, <laughs> you're good. Yeah. <laughs> but then... You might get married, you might have kids, you might have a mortgage, life insurance, car payments, all sorts of things, and that's when the complexity will start. But 
certainly in our business, and I see this all the time, even a pound of cure is better than an ounce of prevention. Mm -hmm. And so the right time is now for anyone. So if someone's listening to this episode right now and they're thinking, hmm, maybe I do want to seek out a financial planner or a financial advisor, portfolio manager to just help me figure out my finances, what should they be looking for in an advisor? Because I know people are very, obviously very emotional about their money and it's hard to give it away to just anybody. So how, what, what questions are we asking an advisor when we meet with them to make sure they're the right person to manage our money? It's a great question and lots has been said and written about this, Rennie. But what I say to prospective clients to whom I speak is that the most important thing is an emotional fit. What do I mean by that? I mean, do you see things the same way mm. with respect to money? Are your financial backgrounds the same? Do you share the same socioeconomic type of fabric as your would-be advisor? Do you enjoy relating to them? Do you feel you have what to talk to them about? Mm -hmm. Do you feel that a year or two or three into the relationship, you're going to keep their attention? Do you feel that they're going to keep your attention? Do you feel that you're actually going to have fun with your advisor? Mm -hmm. And if you answer yes to most, hopefully all of those questions, then I'm very confident that you'll be well served by your advisor. Mm -hmm. Because switching advisors, I'm not going to say it would be traumatic, but it's, it's a, it can be a hassle. Yeah. I get it. It's not, a, it's not an easy decision. It's not an easy decision. And yeah. You'll notice when, when you ask what you should look for, Rennie, there are two things that I didn't mention. Their low fees <laughs> or their unbelievable returns. Okay. Why? Because money management is a very critical piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. No less critical than a heart surgeon. Would you go to the cheapest heart surgeon? <laughs> no. Probably not. Run away from that, yeah. And with respect to returns, no two portfolios are alike, no two clients are alike, no two circumstances are alike. So the fact that your advisor tells you he's averaging, pick a number, 10% a year, does that make him twice as good or much better than an advisor who's averaging 5% a year? Absolutely not. Different mandates, different styles, different books, different economic circumstances. And so just because an advisor tells you that he or she's outperformed another advisor or a benchmark, mm -hmm. that in my mind's eye is not reason enough to select that advisor. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know you mentioned fees and we haven't spoken about this, but... How do fees work when you're working with an advisor? Is it that it's a based on it's a percentage based on whatever amount of money we have? Is it can we just get advice from them and then manage our own portfolio? Like, are, what are the if you know all the different structures that are out there? Yeah, so there are several different structures out there. So structure number one is at its very simplest form what we might call a traditional account, okay. and that would generally hold mutual funds. Each mutual fund charges an MER, management expense ratio. It's a nice word for a fee. And the advisor probably won't charge a fee to buy and or sell a fund. Okay. Second idea is what we call a commission-only account. The advisor is holding stocks, ETFs, and or bonds, and only charges a fee when and if there are any trades. Okay. In other words, if there's no trades in a certain year. Pay nothing. <laughs> pay nothing. Okay. I get it. Do you still get like the one-on-one -on -one calls with them and things like that? Is that? Great question. 
The answer would be yes in my practice. But also as I look at my own practice, 95% of my clients are not on that structure. Okay. Because we as a collective, when I say we, myself and said client, we don't see tremendous value in such a relationship. Okay. It doesn't breed trust and consequently don't see a lot of value. Okay. And the far more popular way, far, far, far more dominant is a flat fee per year irrespective of the amount of trades that are done. Generally on a, on a portfolio less than 3 million, it runs somewhere between 1.3 and 1.7%. As the account grows, there are certain thresholds that sliding scale downwards. Mm -hmm. And that is the most convenient, most popular type of account setup. Why? It breeds trust. There's an unlimited amount of trades that one can do. Mm -hmm. And it gives you the ultimate inflexibility how you and or my client want to run the portfolio. Okay. So that means that in this type of account, you are paid a percentage of whatever assets under management. And so does that mean if you could do 10,000 trades, like obviously you're not going to, but you could do 10,000 trades that year and it would still be the same fee as if you did one trade that year. That's right. Interesting. Interesting. That's quite right. Okay. Because thanks to technology and it's that it's so readily available, I don't know the exact number, but the cost of executing a trade is very low. Mm -hmm. So the banks <coughs> are not too concerned anymore with the number of trades, okay. but they're concerned with things like client satisfaction. Is the client in the right part of the bank? Mm -hmm. Is the account growing? That's more where they're concerned about. That's where the bread is buttered mm -hmm. as opposed to how many trades you did or did not do. Mm -hmm. So how about like actual returns? Are... I think the argument that a lot of people make for doing DIY is because they, they believe they can get higher returns than an advisor. So, because the fees, obviously, you're paying a fee for an advisor. So, say there's a 1.7% fee that you're paying and your portfolio is up like 3% or 4%. I think then you're not actually up 4% because you are paying that 1.7% right. fee. So, how do you, what, what do you say to that, those comments about, oh, I can do, I can do this better on my own? What, what do you say to that? <laughs> it's a great question. And I come across that question several times a year. Mm -hmm. And to that I'll say, really, can you do better? <laughs> okay. And what I see is, it can be that a do-it-yourselfer in a year or two or three will do better than a portfolio manager. Absolutely. But you've also got to look at the risk that said portfolio is taking on. In other words, to give you an analogy, there's two sides to a balance sheet. There's assets and liabilities. Mm -hmm. And if you just look at the asset side of a balance sheet, you might see 10 million in assets. You might think that person's very wealthy. Mm -hmm. It appears that way. But if you're not looking at the liabilities of 9,900,000, you're failing to see that that person is only worth $100,000. Mm -hmm. And a do-it-yourself investor is only concerned with how much money they made or didn't lose. Mm -hmm. Okay, they made 20% last year. Certainly possible. But what risk were they taking on to do that? And the second thing is, it's a human characteristic, <coughs> nobody likes to speak about losses. In other words, how many people do you know that went to Vegas... <laughs> that came back a loser. People don't talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. People don't talk about the money they lost in the markets. And if last year they made 50%, what they're probably not telling you is the year before they lost 60%. So you've got to take what anybody says, whether it's an investment advisor or a do-it-yourselfer, what's the track record? And more importantly, what's the risk? Mm -hmm. Because people don't like paying bank fees. I get it. Yeah, at all. <laughs> I get it. I don't like paying my accountant. 
And the few times in the past 30 years I've required the lawyer, I don't like paying the lawyer either. Yeah. I'll be honest. <laughs> mm -hmm. But day in, and day out, you get what you pay for. for sure. And that's one of the immutable laws of economics. Mm -hmm. I've also heard of some uh, the advice-only structure where you pay an advisor for them to advise you, like maybe make a financial plan for you, but then after that, you don't work with them. You're going and basically executing it on yourself by yourself. Is that something that you've heard of? I have heard of that. There are some planners who will simply do a... I've seen some outstanding plans produced by independent financial planners, mm -hmm. and that's all they'll do based upon data that you will provide them based upon assumptions they will make mm -hmm. about how you want to live your lifestyle, they will come up and present you with a very cogent, well thought through plan. Perfect. But that's only half the problem. Given that that's where the re-engagement stops, how are you going to make your investments work for you? Mm -hmm. They can't say any better than I can on the 12th of January, sell the, uh, Dow Jones index and buy Apple stocks mm -hmm. or bond prices are going to go down. So therefore get out of bonds now or next week. So big believer in the notion of financial planning, but make sure that that, so to speak, jives with your overall investment strategy yeah. if possible. Remy. Okay. So another question I had was what are some of the biggest misconceptions that people may have about working with an investment advisor or a financial advisor? There are several, and I'd like to comment on them. Mm -hmm. Number one, oh, you just put my money into the market. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, what is the market? I don't know what the market is. Yeah. <laughs> That's the antithesis of what I do. I don't just put my client's money into the market, however you define that. Mm -hmm. Second misconception that I hear is, oh yeah, you just put me into the bank's own products because you make more money. Yes, okay, that's something I hear a lot. The reality is I'm product agnostic. Good to know. And if you're looking for products... There's 13,000 equities and ETFs you can buy. Throw some darts, you'll find a product. This is, a not, this is not a business that's about products. It's about concepts. It's about making intuitive decisions and managing risk. Mm -hmm. And I've never had any pressure, and it is a prohibited practice to simply put you in bank products. Third misconception that I hear all the time is, oh, you just follow BMO's research. Now, we have got a very excellent research team. So do all the banks, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. But I'd be very disingenuous if I just only followed BMO's research. I follow third-party research from other Canadian banks I do my own research and global banks as well. So it's a multitude of research that allows me to make intelligent and intuitive decisions. Okay. And one other misconception I hear about advisors is, oh, you'll just trade my account so you can make lots of money on commissions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's called churning. There's a word for it. It's a prohibited practice you get to lose your license Ooh, okay. for churning accounts. <laughs> Good to know. And it just wouldn't happen, certainly at one of the big five banks. They've got mechanisms in place to ensure that, to ensure that those types of prohibited practices don't occur. Okay. And if somebody still has listened to this whole episode and they still are like, okay, I, I don't want to seek any professional advice. I still want to do DIY investing which I'm sure like a lot of people will still. Um, do you have any key considerations that they should keep in mind when they're still selecting investments for their portfolio? Is there anything that they should not do, something they should do? Yeah, 
And to be clear, there's a lot of people that manage their own money. Mm -hmm. I'd argue more do than don't. <laughs> than don't. Yes, I agree. So a few things that I would look for. Number one is have a methodology and stick to your methodology as opposed to going where the wind blows. Number two, don't overexpose yourself to any one sector, mm. whether it's oil and gas, technology, finance, real estate, materials, utilities, resources. Diversify across different sectors. Mm -hmm. Something else I come across fairly frequently, and there's a term for it, it's called home bias. Okay. Make no mistake, Renny, I'm a very, very proud Canadian but we only run about 3% of the world's GDP as a country. Yeah. <laughs> so don't just buy Canadian names. Mm -hmm. Buy U.S. names as well. Yeah. Why? Their economy is broader. It's not so dependent upon resources and banks. Like ours is. Like ours is. And currency, holding U.S. dollars, or multi-currency, is known to reduce risk. Mm. So don't just stick to... Canadian companies yeah. okay. is, is what I'd say. And eyes wide open. Our business changes quickly. Economic circumstances change quickly. So you've got to be prepared to, I know the word is a little bit overused, pivot, but you've got to be prepared to make sweeping changes at any time. Mm -hmm. And okay, thank you for that. And do you think you can share any success stories that maybe you've had with some of your clients? Just so that you can inspire us, all the listeners. Thank you. So as I said earlier on, I take a deep emotional interest in the lives and livelihoods of our clients. There's skin in the game. I want to see our clients do well. Mm -hmm. And without getting into specifics, because confidentiality prohibits me from doing that, there's a few different touch points that I can uh, put onto the table, so to speak. Number one, I've heard several times, John, for the first time in a long time, I'm actually sleeping well. Mm. Money is not keeping me awake. Because they've outsourced it to, some, to someone they trust. And that, for me, is a big, big compliment. Secondly, a little bit unusual a fair percentage of our clients are women. Many instances, women prefer to work with women advisors, mm -hmm. but more than 40% of my book are women. Mm -hmm. And BMO have been very gracious to nurture me along that route over the years. And the success story there is we know the devastating effects of marital breakdown or marital discord financially. They are... I've seen it before. It can be catastrophic, nothing short of catastrophic. Yeah. And when I onboard a woman going through marital discord and two years later her marriage has ended and she's saying, wow, look at where I've come. Mm -hmm. I'm very humbled that that's happened more than several times. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other area that I focus in on is another myth that, oh, I'm at one year retirement, so yeah, it'll be okay. Mm. That's a myth. And the success story around that is, John, you've gotten me to where I now feel comfortable with mathematical underpinnings that my retirement will be what I want it to be. Mm -hmm. And that is a very humbling feeling of course. when I've, been along for the ride, if you will. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. I feel like I've learned a lot from this episode and I hope everyone else has learned a lot. I have one last question for you. If you could give one piece of advice to our listeners to ensure they don't go broke trying to manage their own wealth, what would that advice be? Wow. <laughs> one, it's hard to narrow down to one. Okay. Maybe top two, top three. <laughs> top two, top three. One, continual savings monthly two make sure you understand the risks of what you're doing mm -hmm. 
And three, stay consistent. I just have to add a fourth. Okay. <laughs> Don't be greedy. Oh, that's a big, that's a good one. <laughs> Greed is one of the biggest reasons why people lose boatloads of money. It's Always leave a little bit of money on the table mm -hmm. and you'll be invited back to the party. <laughs> I like that saying. Well, John, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for educating my audience. I thought this was a very insightful episode. If somebody wanted to reach out to you and learn more about your business, how can they do so? Thank you. So first of all, I'd say what a pleasure and an honor that has, it has been for me to spend time with you today and to hopefully help your listeners. A lot of what I do is about education and about literacy. So it's always a pleasure to speak to people about our business. Lots of ways you can reach me. Uh, phone 416-590-7661 or by email john, J-O-H-N dot Saki, S-A-C-K-E at N for Nesbitt, B for Burns, P for Private, C for Client, D for Division dot com. Mm -hmm. And you have a website as well. I do. The website is my name. It's my BMO corporate website, johnsaki.com. Perfect. Lots of ways to reach me. Yes. And on LinkedIn and through social media. Yeah. So I will make sure to leave all of John's links in the description box and in the show notes if you want to reach him. I, again, I worked with him for a few years and I had a, I'm had. i sure you all have a great experience working with him. So yeah, check him out. I would love you all to let me know if you do. And yeah, thank you so much, John, for being here. I really, really, really do appreciate it. Renny, thank you so much. The pleasure is mine. Yes. And everyone, if you enjoyed this episode, please share it on social media. You can share it on your Instagram story. You can share it on LinkedIn. If you share it on LinkedIn, please tag John and I. We would love to see that you are listening. And yes, I will see you in the next episode. Bye, everyone.